Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. I would like to start with the anatomy of the nasal cavity and the paranasal sinuses, which give access to that where you are going to the cellar. So basically, just one idea, when you look on the paranasal sinuses, where do we have them for? It's, they were not constructed by nature during the millions of uh, years of evolution in order to make happy our ENT colleagues, in order to provide them with work. They were also not introduced only to give a resonance cavity. They were not only used for making some light white construction of the skull, because otherwise if you had your solid bone, if you didn't have that, then the back musculature would be used much more for keeping the head in a balance by this, by these excavations of the paranasal sinuses, by the ventilation of the paranasal sinuses, we have a better light right construction so the head is more in equilibrium. But there's one more reason why we have these paranasal sinuses and that reason lies in the development of um, the paranasal sinuses and the nose itself. They were used mainly to shift the nose and the eye and the eye cavity towards the midline. Because initially the eyes were positioned just lateral on the head. Then what you see here are not the eyes. The eyes are on this embryo on the sixth week located somewhere here far lateral. That what we see here is the lateral and the medial nasal process. And this lateral and medial nasal process are pushed together by the force of the development of the paranasal sinuses, so they come to a midline, there's an insertion of an intermaxillary process, and after that insertion of the intermaxillary process, the medial and lateral nasal processes come together, and they start forming then in the midline, the nose and the nasal septum after that insertion of the intermaxillary process. Well, basically, the positioning of the orbiter towards the front is only made possible by that shift that we find from the lateral side or from the lateral part to the medial part. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible at all. So when we look on the nasal cavity, we realize that we have some means for increasing the surface, the inner surface of the nose. On the lateral side, we find these uh, turbinates, the inferior turbinate, the middle turbinate, and the superior turbinate. And these turbinates are covered with a, of the mucosal surface that's why it's looking so wet, a mucosal surface that guarantees that the air that we breathe in is moistured and also warmed up because with an ambient temperature of 20 degrees, well, it's not always like in India in summer, that you don't need the warming, that you need only the moisturing of the air. We need that in order to make the gas exchange possible in the alveoli. With an Humidity, like we have here in this room now today, perhaps 55, 60 percent, it wouldn't be possible to make a gas exchange. And the distance that we have from the trachea down to the alveoli is too little. When there's a flow with each breath, 15 breaths a minute, there's a flow of 600, 700 millimeters. That's why we need to increase the surface where we can exchange and moisturize the air in order to make possible the gas exchange in the alveoli. In the alveoli, we have a humidity of around 99%. It's nearly foggy there. Nobody ever looked into one individual alveolus. I never realized that before. When we look with a scanning electron microscope in alveolus, that's looking quite nicely, but we are always looking on an artifact. No man, well, we have been on the moon everywhere, but nobody has ever looked into an individual alveolus. But that's what we know from physiology. So we have to, to moisturize, so we start from that area from the Lehman Nasi, that's the area where we can go up with a little finger easily, but uh, we will never reach the turbinates and uh, especially we will not, never reach the area on the roof of the nose where the olfactory nerve is coming down and getting um, the fila terminalis or the fila, olfactory fila down there. Two landmarks that we need to recall is one is the sphenoethmoidal recess just behind the superior nasal conchae that has a distance from the Lehman Nasi of around 45 millimeters. Usually we do not, it's very variable in size and uh, may be variable in the extension. However, what is a constant feature is the sphenopalatine foramen that we find just behind the middle uh, turbinate. The sphenopalatine foramen is of utmost importance in so far as this foramen gives the access to the pterygopalatine fossa. And through this pterygopalatine fossa, we find the origin of the vessels, namely of the arteries of the sphenopalatine artery that is nourishing the majority of this plexus of the vascular plexus here in the mucosa.
And then it's also the entrance point or the exit point from the skull for the sphenopalatine uh, nasal nerves, the superior and the superior nasal nerves. They all emerge here through the sphenopalatine foramen behind there. So the basis, the bone basis for these turbinates are the superior and middle conchia. These belong to the ethmoid bone. It's a part of the ethmoid bone. However, the inferior turbinate, the biggest turbinate, is a bone by itself. It's an original, that's why in the American literature it's called the osteos turbinale. In nomina anatomica, in the official anatomical uh, nomenclature, there is no name for it. It's only called inferior turbinate and that's it. So basically it's an own bone that is then uh, fusing together with uh, the ethmoid bone in the front, in with the palatine bone in the posterior and in the basal part and with the maxillar in the anterior and basal part. These turbinate bones are very thin bones. So from the turbinate itself, the majority is only the vascular plexus and the mucosa. The bony tissue is very fragile. It's a very thin bone, can be easily cracked. Sometimes even the turbinates may be uh, also pneumatized, pneumatized uh, just like the paranasal sinus. Maybe that these are small bulla. It's called then the concha bullosa or such a big bulla in the middle turbinate, which is uh, significantly bigger. You see that there are some connections and that's the same etiology to the cells that to the bulla cells that we find more superior located. So all this makes uh, indeed an enlargement of the surface, leaving little space for the inferior meatus, the middle meatus, and the superior meatus, where the air comes through. Uh, here in that section, that frontal section, you also see the maxillary sinus. Maxillary sinus cut off here, as we said, light white construction of that. The conchia only form when we get a right fusion of the lateral and medial nasal processes from each side. If we don't have that correct fusion, then also a retarded fusion, then we get also retarding in the development of these uh, surface uh, structures. And that is visible then in hypoplastic, in hypoplastic uh, sinuses, like here in the maxillary sinus, you see this very small, a very shallow sinus. So there is no big excavation and just corresponding to that also the turbinates are formed very little. If you have a complete aplasia of the turbinates, then it looks like that on the lateral surface of the nose and you can easily detect that also the nose itself is indeed malformated and not formated in a, in a normal fashion. So coming back to the construction site, here is the septum, septum nasi, which is also covered by that plexus. We see indeed that we have a venous cavernous tissue that's uh, way thicker than the bone itself. The monolaminar bone is very thin, plate, easily crackable. The majority of that is a vascular plexus that is used for increasing uh, the fluidity transfer to the surface in order to moisturize the stuff correctly. This is in that case a real venous cavernous tissue. It's not like in the genitals an arterial cavernous tissue. It's a venous cavernous tissue. We don't need a high pressure here. Um, but we need a pretty much uh, um, fluid transport. You realize that, that also most, when we lie on the side during sleep, only one nostril is open, the other is obstructed and blocked, usually the one that is down there. It's obstructed because there's a swelling of this cavernous tissue. When you turn around, go flip from the right side to the left side, you realize, oh, it's blocked, the nose is blocked. It takes only two minutes and then this uh, venous swelling will decrease and the other takes over. So this is indeed a highly reactive stuff that we need always. Indeed, we um, see on the surface of the structure then, of course, a respiratory epithelium, typically respiratory epithelium, and uh, we see lots of vessels uh, originating from these already called um, sphenopalatine artery that's nourishing the majority of the vessels here of the surface. The sphenopalatine artery belongs to the external carotid artery. It's a, one of the terminal branches of the maxillary artery. The last branch that's given off is the meningeal, the middle meningeal artery. So the sphenopalatine artery crosses in to the sphenopalatine foramen together with the nasal nerves and then making also some anastomosis with branches from the ophthalmic artery that give off the anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries. Then we have also some branches that are interconnecting down here to the palatine artery, that's a descending palatine artery that also uh, goes then to the foramen palatinum uh, major, and that's connecting then upside down. On the medial side, we find the same branches. There are also some external carotid artery branches 
uh, that go onto the uh, septum and then nourish the surface of the septum. Septum itself is a composite of three different structures. It contains on the one hand, on the basal part, the vomory bone, the vomory bone, and then it's accomplished from the lamina perpendicular of the ethmoid bone coming down from the top. Here's the area cribosa with the feel of the terminal olfactory branches. And this composite of these two bones is accomplished by the cartilage of the septum, hyalinous cartilage, that's growing in from the front. So if you have two structures, one growing down, one growing up, and one coming from the front, then it's evident it will never be straight. It's not an exemption, but a rule that we have a septum deviation, mostly in the area where the vomory bone comes together with the perpendicular ethmoid bone process. So it's more or less a rule and not an exemption. But of course, for you, for the axis, it would be easier if it was just straight. But the advantage of a deviation is that at least one nostril is a little bit bigger than the other. So let's go back to the lateral side, to the lateral side of the nasal cavity. If we cut off the inferior turbinate, here's the inferior turbinate, here was the middle turbinate cut off. Then we see you can expose the nasolacrimal duct. You will never see that in your techniques, in your access route, because you go straight to the sphenoid sinus and you try to leave away, leave apart the inferior turbinate and the middle turbinate, but just for orientation. And then if we go up between the inferior and middle turbinate, we find the processus uncinatus. And that processus uncinatus gives an access to the opening of the hiatus seminaris, to the access of the maxillary sinus. So more cranially and more occipitally, we find the ethmoid bullae, ethmoid bullae, and then here the, some ethmoid bullae are open. And then if we go backwards, we get into the sphenoidal sinus. The ethmoid bullae are highly variable. The ethmoid cellular or bullae are discerned for the ENT by posterior and anterior bullae. The anterior bullae are then categorized to a superior, middle and inferior bullae. The rest ones are the posterior bullae and they come very close to the sphenoid sinus. So the sphenoid sinus is usually found when we go from the demon nasi in a distance of about 5 to 6 centimeters. This is a typical type of a cellar type of a sphenoid sinus. It may also be that we have more or less a conchal type where we find only a very little opening of the sphenoid sinus. But this is then, of course, a little bit more difficult to access. But in the normal case, more than 85% in the cellar type, we find that typical correlation that we have the zelatokica uh, just above on the roof of the sphenoid sinus. The clevosphenoidalis forms the back part, and the anterior part is then the wall that is separating from the nasal part. We shouldn't forget that this uh, sphenoid sinus is a paired structure. Paired structure, it's from left and right. It was also shifted in the midline. So this is only a part of the sinus. We see it from lateral. We look from the medial side towards the lateral side. So it doesn't take into account that there's a septum originating from the roof going down to the floor of the cellar. One more thing that may happen is that we have within the sphenoid sinus frequently also uh, visible the optical nerve in a, separate in a separate channel. There can be some ethmoid bulla around that or it can be into direct connection to the sphenoid sinus. If we have some bulla around it, then we call it an onodi cell, onodi cell encircling just like the ethmoid bulla uh, encircling the optical nerve but that's an exemption more or less. So we have a supraoptical recess here in that case. Here it's also visible in that specimen. Optical nerve canal runs down here. So we have a supraoptical large recess that goes up here. It is found about a quarter of the cases. So we have severe left-right differences caused by the septum, just like in the nasal septum, it's not said that it's in that it's symmetrical. Here we see that the right optical nerve is placed way downwards compared to the left one, which is way upwards. So this is these left-right differences they are quite normal for that. This is a type of a conchal sphenoidal sinus. You see that the distance and the wall of the bone um, from this uh, sphenoidal sinus towards the floor of the cellar is way thicker than we saw in the typical case. Good news is that with age, usually the bony tissue here is resorbed, that it's uh, thinned, but we are way apart here in that case from such a situation in an elderly person where we see that the whole floor of the cellar is a very thin membrane 
It's a very thin bony structure. It's hardly impossible to discern between the capsule of the pituitary and the dura and the bony tissue itself. Okay, now orientation. Uh, here's the tongue, the mouth cavity, and uh, here's the nose. The no nasal septum is still exposed. Ah, we can flip this open. Nasal septum is flipped open. So this is the access route. We go through the nostril. We go through the nostril upwards. Here's the middle turbinate. The inferior turbinate is not completely exposed. And we can see from the sinus only a part. I wanted to show something else. You can see here only the septum. See, the septum is really coming up from the roof. It's coming up from the roof down to the floor. It's a pretty small uh, sphenoid sinus. I wouldn't call this typical uh, sphenoidal sinus because we have here only a very small opening and the pituitary is just above here. So the cavity is empty. Perhaps we can crack that open. Yeah, when we crack in here and open that, yeah, it doesn't become much larger. Yeah, this is a very small one. What, perhaps you look on this one, because what I wanted to show you are the recesses that we find in the sphenoidal sinus. So here again the nose, we go up. Here the turbinate, uh, the middle turbinate is only left, uh, the mucosal surface. And here we get an access into uh, the sphenoidal sinus. The pituitary has been here. Oh, is it still there? No, it's removed. It's removed. Here's the ligamentum zellae that is still intact up here. Here's the cavity for uh, the pituitary, and we see that here the sphenoidal sinus is way bigger than we had it in the other case. And here we have a large recess, a lateral recess, that goes down into the depth. Here's a smaller lateral recess, and we find even down here a pretty big one. So this would give you, in that case here, a pretty large operational field, a very nice axis and a very big access route to the pituitary and to the zella turkica, to the floor of the cella. Way better than it was in the other one. So, but how do we get in here? This, perfu this perforation that was made here by the cut is way bigger than it's you know, usually. In real life, we have only a small slit-like opening. The light is missing. Here's the optical nerve and the carotid protuberance here. And here's the optocarotic recess. Okay, the optocarotic recess. So, and below that is then the, you can imagine that's the cause of the, um, exactly. Okay, thank you very much. The access that we find into the cavity, oh, here we have the very same like we pointed out. The access here, it's only by the forceps. The access that we find in here is through a slit-like or pinhead-like opening. The opening may be smaller than that, that's in this large one, four or five millimeter is more or less a big one. It is usually obstructed and you see only very little from that because the mucosa that is covering that from the nosal side, this is here seen from posterior, anteriorly from the sinus sinus, this will be of course a little bit smaller than. This is a typical view that we have after the middle turbinate. If you deflect the middle turbinate, then we see it already on the top and here in more detail. So it's more or less a roundish or pinhead light uh, structure doesn't matter whether it's small or big because it will anyway be opened, the whole posterior wall, so uh, we don't care for that. Another feature that should be taken into account, we already mentioned that the septum uh, may be uh, shifted towards one side, like here on that side. So this paired sinus is divided into two uh, cavities. It may also be completely or incompletely divided from a transverse septum. Here's a spur of a transverse septum that originates from the tuberculum cellae from the floor of the cellar and goes then tends then down. There may also be some other ridges like we see here on the lateral wall. All of this is done in the sphenoid bone. All these structures belong like a sphenoid sinus to the sphenoid bone. By the way, it should be kept into mind that this sphenoid bone is a typical misnomer, typical example for plagiarism that we find already in the medieval because this uh, sphenoid bone Sphenoid doesn't mean man much thing, only a wedge-shaped stuff. Originally it was called the sphicoid bone or wasp bone. And when you look on this uh, sphenoid bone from the frontal view or from the posterior or from the frontal or from the posterior view, you realize that it's really looking like a wasp with the ala major and ala minor. But some monks in the medieval they copy-pasted the stuff and they mistaken 
the sphicoid bone to the sphenoid bone. And ever since then, anatomists are writing sphenoid bone. So copy-paste was already used at that time. Oh, but did I mention that? Uh, there's one more structure that we have to talk about, the forum lacerum. Forum lacerum, the tyroid canal or the vidian canal, containing the nerves, the deep prefrosal nerve and the greater prefrosal nerve on their way from the superior salivatory nucleus. They pass through that forum lacerum that is occluded by a fibrous, more or less by a fibrous mass. It's not a real cartilage, it's a fibrous tissue that's around there. And that uh, vidian nerve contains of two parts. We have on the one hand the deep petrosal nerve. Deep petrosal nerve that contains the preganglionary, preganglionary sympathetic fibers that then are crossed over in the pterygopalatine uh, ganglion and go to the uh, lacrimal gland and also the glands of the nose. And then on the other hand we have the greater petrosal nerve that contains the preganglionary parasympathetic fibers that originate from the superior salivatory nucleus and go through the pterygopalatine foramen and then to the target organs in the nose and the stuff. Okay, let's have a look on endoscopic anatomy. This is an image taken from the original paper from one of the first studies of the group of uh, Capabianca. When we look in, into the sphenoid sinus, we see here in the top, after the opening of the sphenoid sinus, we see on the top of it the, the sphenoidal planum. With the, cella, with the floor of the cellar, and we see then laterally the uh, carotid protuberance, what I should try to show you already, and the optic protuberance. And in between the optic protuberance and the carotid protuberance, we find the lateral optocarotic recess. That may be a pretty deep one, medium-sized lung, like we saw here in the original specimen, but can also be pretty shallow. And then on the medial side, find the medial optocarotic recess. Below and occipital of the cellar floor, the clevus sphenoidalis is showing up, and then we see the carotid artery in the with the paraclival segment coming up from the basal, from the typical S shape, left and right to the uh, sphenoidal clevus clivus. So the next image shows you again. That's an image from Capabianca, the medial optocarotic recess, the lateral optocarotic recess, uh, the carotid protuberance. Here the cellar floor again, and here the clevus sphenoidalis. You see there's a remarkable distance between left and right carotid artery. These carotid arteries may in places come together, like we see it here with the kissing arteries, where then, of course, the access route is a little bit limited because they come very close together. Another feature of what we see here is that the bony structure covering uh, the carotid artery may be thinned out significantly. The bone is not thick. It's a very thin one. It can be less than 0.2 millimeters. And sometimes I have the impression that you can even see nicely the pulsation of the artery through the bone itself. Here again, the close-up of the lateral optocarotic recess of the medial optocarotic recess. And you see here also in that case, the bone structure is extremely small. So let's go back to anatomy and pass by this uh, structure. So let's go a little bit further down and laterally. When you go further down and laterally, then we see in the paraclival segment all the nerves that go to the sphenoidal, to the fissura orbitalis superior, so superior orbital fissure. And that's it, of course, uh, separately in the optic tract goes to the uh, canalis opticus, the optical canal, whereas all the other nerves, the oculomotor nerve, the uh, trochlearis nerve, and the abducent nerve, run parasitically and they tend then to the superior fissure. The nerves are embedded into a vascular plexus and we see a typical arrangement of the nerves, namely the oculomotor nerve is the highest one. <coughs> Below the oculomotor nerve comes then the trochlearis nerve, whereas the abducent nerve, which has the longest subdural or epidural course, it leaves uh, already from the brainstem pretty early, it has about more than one and a half centimeter subdural uh, epidural course uh, on the cleaval segment, going below the tentorium, going right there. That is into deep, into intimate contact with the carotid artery. It's lying deeper, more profound, or closer to the wall of the sinuid sinus than the oculomotor nerve or the trochlearis nerve. Then we have, of course, the ophthalmic nerve with the branch, <coughs> the first branch of the trigeminal nerve that's running up there. In a tissue, uh, so embedded in, in the cavernous sinus, 
the coronal signs, you will see it again in the macroscopic image. Here is the optical nerve, uh, here is the carotid artery cut down, here is the oculomotor nerve, and here that's the trochlearis nerve that's in the forceps, and below the forceps is the ophthalmic nerve, and here runs um, then very deep, close to the artery, then the abducent nerve. All that stuff here are remnants from the cavernous sinus that is embedding the parasegmal, paraclival and paracellarly running nerves and structures. These uh, cavernous sinuses, left and right, may be interconnected in more than two-thirds of the cases by um, an intercavernous sinus that's running on the cellar floor and connecting left and right in the profound profundity of the cellar trochica. And they are also connected by some uh, venous plexuses that are running over the ligamentum cellar. So we have intimate uh, correlations between left and right, so shifts may occur, especially when we have it on the floor of the cellar, which you're going to open with your drill. In the frontal section, it looks like that. Here you can see it again, left and right cellar, uh, left and right, uh, sorry, cavernous sinus, interconnected here on the floor of the cellar, below the pituitary, by an intercavernous sinus. So in fact, again, we see that uh, next to the artery, next to the carotid artery, uh, runs the abducent nerve, very deep, whereas the oculomotor nerve, the trochlearis nerve and the ophthalmic nerve running a little bit more superficially closer to um, the border of the dura. So when we open now that um, planum of the cellar, here we have the planum of the cellar, again the optocarotic recess, laterally, medially, carotid artery, clivus. When we open that, then we get the exposure then on the cellar on the pituitary gland and on we see then from after the opening above the wall, we see here then the superior hypophysial artery that gives off the branches that run down to the pituitary stalk. Here another image from a cadaver specimen that was not injected. Here in that case it was injected, non-injected ones. So we see in the cranial part pituitary, we see cranially then the chiasma, the optical olfactory nerve, the chiasm, and here when you look up in more detail, ophthalmic artery branching off from the internal carotid artery, again the superior hypophysial artery here above the optical nerve and the pituitary stalk that runs in together with the vessels to the pituitary gland. So non-injected specimen again, uh, the chiasm, the gyrus rectus or the rectal gyrus in the upper nerve encircled by the olfactory nerve that is running below it. So the eminencia, uh, the fenestration of the lamina terminalis, so shows then the massa intermedia. And we see the A1 segment and the anterior communicating artery connecting left and right anterior cerebral artery to each other. And we look now a little bit more to the side. Again, the pituitary stalk, uh, A1 segment of the arteries left and right, and the chiasm of the optical nerve. And going down towards the floor of the third ventricle, see then a typical arrangement again with the third nerve, with the uh, oculomotor nerve that passes through the P1 segment of the um, posterior cerebral artery and the superior cerebellar artery, typically then turning to the right, coming into connection to the internal carotid artery and heading forwards to it. So in a more laterally close-up, we see it again, oculomotor nerve between the P1 segment and the superior cerebellar artery. So these are the more or less the, the lateral aspects of the retrocellular spaces and I hope that we are able to see that also in the cadaver specimens today in that exposition. Thank you very much.